Commissar Molotov of Russia arrives at Blair House in Washington, where he was the government's guest prior to his departure for the World Security Conference at San Francisco. He confers with Anthony Eden and Secretary Statinius during his stay at the Capitol. The Soviet foreign minister came to the United States at the direct invitation of President Truman to assist other members of the security conference in reaching a closer understanding. This 110-inch airplane tire is about to get the most severe test it's possible to give. At Wright Field Laboratories, a 370,000-pound steel wheel is revolved at 180 miles per hour, creating a gigantic braking power which is carefully measured. At the proper moment, the tire is pushed against the wheel, absorbing a shock many times greater than that of a landing plane. This rubber was torn loose in the first grinding impact before the flywheel was slowed down. Weighing three quarters of a ton, some idea of the size of this giant may be gained by comparison with the standard tire of a B-17 and the tire of a Cub plane. Another army experiment in safety. A crowd of 30,000 assembles to see the last B-17 roll from the assembly line of the Boeing Seattle plant. Henceforth, this factory will be devoted exclusively to the production of B-29 superforts. Stickers commemorate the thousands of missions on which the flying forts have performed so gallantly throughout the world. Salute to a great airplane. Entering the final phase of victory over Hitler's Nazis, Yank armies swarm across western Germany, bringing devastation to cities of the Reich. From all sides, Allied might crushes in on the remains of the Wehrmacht, bringing home the horrors of war to the German people as they have never experienced it before. The white flag of surrender flies all along the battle-torn route as our fast-moving armies sweep to a junction with the Russians. German medical units handle casualties as captured Folkstrom troops swell the total of a million prisoners. As the Yanks arrive, civilians turn out to wonder at the fate that awaits a conquered nation. A Burgermeister addresses a civilian gathering, but German morale breaks down and unruly crowds loot wreck stores. <music> Signal Corps cameramen film the looting of freight and passenger cars loaded with civilian and military goods. Other pictures showing the drive on Berlin were taken by newsreel cameramen. American MPs handle the traffic problem. Scrap metal from wrecked airplanes and German telephone equipment were being hauled in this wrecked train of 75 cars. Graveyards such as this one, where the Gestapo buried 30,000 Russians in three and a half years, are only one result of mass starvation and brutality encountered by the Yanks. Prison camps and forced labor camps took a heavy toll of millions of miserable people enslaved by the Nazis. These girls suffered incredible hardships when forced to work in German munitions factories. Slave workers who came from many parts of Europe. Each girl wore a number tattooed on her arm. And here is stark evidence of German torture. Yellow identifying crosses were daubed in their clothing. Thousands of these unhappy humans are being freed daily by the Allied armies. Years of privation left their mark on these men, gathering for cigarettes and to receive instructions from British and American military authorities. The Yanks get a rousing welcome. Among the crowds in the square, a Russian girl spots a Gestapo agent in civilian clothes posing as a Dutchman. He's quickly hustled off to jail. <laughs> the 
In France, three million families wait eagerly for their loved ones to return. Some of them have been gone for five years, and mixed feelings of joy and sadness greet the trains returning with the war prisoners. Such pitiful family reunions are reminders of the devastation and horror visited on the world by the Axis. Falling to our advancing armies is the storied city of Heidelberg, famed for its great university. Once a great center of German culture, the university attracted the patronage of wealthy Americans who contributed this building, captioned to the German spirit by the Nazis. American reporters uncovered the plaque which the Nazis had removed, listing the donors, names familiar to all Americans. It was progressive Americans who helped maintain Heidelberg just to have Nazi supermen grind culture under their heels. The watch on the Rhine has taken on added significance in this war. This time, as our soldiers see the star-spangled banner unfurled, they know that the Allies will police Germany until militarism is stamped out. General Omar Bradley gives personal thanks to his men at this point near Koblenz. It was after a slight pause here that his armies loosed the full fury of the attack on the Reich. Just what they have done, including General Patton's men, is history. The stars and stripes fly in victory over conquered German soil. Fellow delegates, as we enter upon our great task, we cannot forget the millions of men of our armed forces who have given their lives in this cause, nor the other millions of men and women and children who have suffered the cruel agonies of starvation, of torture, and of death. We cannot forget the untold destruction that has been wrought nor can we forget how close our whole civilization has come to utter ruin. It is our supreme responsibility at this conference and afterwards to see to it that this calamity never again falls upon the world. Настоящая конференция, благодаря всему этому, имеет твердую почву для своей успешной деятельности. There can be no letdown in the saving of waste fats and oils. The Japs still prevent the importation of a billion pounds of oil each year. We here at home must make up this loss as fats and oils are vital for thousands of military and civilian needs. Carefully salvages all used fats.
With all the world forecasting the complete capitulation of the European Axis, our heroic wounded, the men who made it possible, enter the Veterans Memorial Opera House in San Francisco. The immediate question is the admission of Argentina to the parley. Ezequiel Padilla, Mexico's Secretary for Foreign Affairs, spoke for the South American Republic, which had signed the Declaration of Chapultepec, Code of Hemispheric Solidarity. Foreign Commissar Molotov argues against the inclusion of Argentina. His plea in Russian is interpreted to the delegates. The proposal made by the Soviet delegation with regard to the question of, of Argentina is that this question, the discussion of this question, should be postponed for a few uh, days in order that we may be able to study. It's the only request made by the Soviet delegation. Tinius, head of the executive and steering committees, followed by Anthony Eden, speaks in favor of Argentina. Ladies and gentlemen, I plead with you to reach a decision in this matter and act now in order that we may get on with our sacred task for which we have met. Uh, those in, in favor uh, of the admission of the Argentine in accordance with the terms previously agreed at our steering committee this morning, will please stand up. Heads of delegation. 31 delegates vote for Argentina, one of the hardest fought questions of the conference. Those against, heads of delegations, please stand up. Only Russia, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and Greece voted to defer the admission of Argentina. Arriving in Washington, Oscar Ibarra Garcia, the newly appointed ambassador from Argentina, is greeted by South American and United States officials. World unity and security will soon be an established fact. On the final lap of their drive on Berlin, Russian troops under Marshals Zhukov and Rosakovsky send the Germans reeling. Cossacks are in action, too. In every city and town, the Nazis fight back with furious desperation. The foe must be wiped out building by building, street by street. Nazi rear guard action is fanatical as they try to stem the red tide. Watch this soldier. A sniper gets him. A machine gunner smokes out the sniper's nest. As the Russians near Berlin, more and more dead Germans litter the gory road. Fighting their way west, the Reds uncover more horror camps, torture hells, staffed by hand-picked sadistic fiends who had at their disposal medieval weapons, such as this beheading board, to slice the last spark of life from broken bodies. Shortly before the Russians arrived, the Germans went on an insane rampage, slaughtering every prisoner they had time to kill. Remember your enemy. Remember these camps and the scores like them, where the Nazis tortured, starved, mutilated, and murdered people for one sin, the sin that they were non-Germans. Look at this face. Look at the faces of those left alive to mourn. This blackest page of history was written by a debased people, the Germans. No starvation here, of course not. This is the town commander. Another bag of Nazis is moved to the rear and the townsfolk sees a chance denied them for years. The protection of red soldiers is all that saves the prisoners from a vengeful people. Left in the wake of the onrushing Reds is the ruined city of Warsaw, scene of an indescribable five-year reign of terror. The once beautiful Polish capital, seat of culture and learning, was laid waste by the Germans as they retreated. During occupation, even trolleys were for Germans only. The immortal Chopin's home was systematically destroyed in demented defeat. 
But at last, the exiled population, those still alive, are able to return to the shells of their former homes. For once more, the Polish flag flies over Warsaw. History in naval warfare is being made off Okinawa as the task force supporting the invasion decisively smashes land-based Jap air attacks. In almost suicidal attacks, Jap planes run a gauntlet of solid anti-aircraft fire. Hundreds of Jap planes were accounted for in the week-long battle. Navy pen of Kyushu. The result is almost always the same. Yank marksmanship, sharpened by battle, is deadly. It is truly a curtain of flak that greets any Jap foolhardy enough to venture within range. But the Japs manage some near bomb misses. Jap air power is being rapidly hammered into oblivion. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into light.
Germany's cities lie in ruins and the hopes of the Nazis lie in the dust. The gutted buildings of the Reich reveal the irresistible power behind the Allied drive, a power that all the vaunted Wehrmacht could not stop. Bismarck's statue frowns upon the shattered wreckage of a Krupp munitions plant, one of the many furnishing tools of war for the Blitzkrieg, Hitler's fast-paced warfare that was stopped cold and flung back in his face, as were these tanks which never left the assembly line. <laughs> Nuremberg in southern Germany, the hotbed shrine city of Nazidum, was overrun by the victorious Yanks. Of all the enemy's level cities, none reflects greater destruction than Nuremberg, where the Allied attack poured its full fury upon the spawning grounds of the Nazis. The haughty German eagle looks down on German dead, lying still in defeat. Over the vast stadium, old glory overshadows one of the world's most hated symbols. Here, where once thousands of swastikas flew above the goose-stepping troops, parading for the strutting Führer, and where he ranted to the assembled thousands, the troops Hitler once laughed at take over. The swastika will no longer flaunt its crooked arms above the Nazi shrine. With the situation well in hand, the Yanks stage a review. Newsreel and Signal Corps cameramen made this record of the last days of Hitler's Germany. The cleansing fires of war have purged Germany of Nazi power. Let's be sure it never again rises from her ashes. Supreme Commander General Eisenhower pays tribute to the men who won our victory. The United Nations will gratefully remember Tedder, Montgomery, Spatz, Bradley, DeLock, Creer, and many others. But all these agree with me in the selection of the truly heroic figure of this war. He is G.I. Joe and his counterpart in the air, the Navy, and the Merchant Marine of every one of the United Nations. He has braved the dangers of U-boat infested seas. He has surmounted charges into desperately defended beaches. He has fought his tedious, patient way through the ultimate in fortified zones. He has endured cold, hunger, fatigue. His companion has been danger. Death has dogged his footsteps. He and his platoon commanders have given us an example of loyalty, devotion to duty, and indomitable courage that will live in our hearts as long as we admire those qualities in men. A Jap suicide plane tore this gaping hole in the side of an American hospital ship. After machine gunning the plainly marked and lighted vessel, the pilot dove this plane into the Mercy ship 60 miles off Okinawa. 29 died in the blast. The 31 wounded are removed at an advanced island base. Nurses were among the victims when the plane plunged into the surgical section of the ship. At the time of the savage attack, the comfort was loaded with battle casualties from the Okinawa action. The dead reached their final resting place in the service cemetery on the island base. Many were men previously wounded on Okinawa to whom the extra shock was fatal. They are mourned by the nurses who strove so gallantly to save them. Yes, VE Day has come and gone, but we still face a Pacific foe capable of slaughtering wounded Americans. Buying that extra bond seems a small thing to do. Mighty Seventh War Loan is underway, and the three survivors of the historic flag raising on Iwo Jima are here at the Capitol to fly that same flag. With an honor guard at attention, that tattered banner goes aloft once more. This flag and the unforgettable picture of the men who raised it on Mount Suribachi 
are to be the symbols of this new war loan drive. What better reminder could we have to buy more bonds? Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau tells us the reasons we should and must. Today, each and every one of us should dedicate himself anew to the task of doing all in his power to bring this war to complete and final victory. There is no more important way in which Americans can express concretely this determination than by buying more extra bonds in the seventh war loan. The workers in the Boeing plant in Seattle set an example for the rest of the country by staying on the job. With the welcome news that the war was over in Europe, they turned out an extra B-29 and turned out then to cheer it on its way to Tokyo. Remember, as these people did, the hard road to complete victory ahead. We have cause for celebration, certainly. But let us not forget, as our Capitol Dome is lighted for the first time since Pearl Harbor, that we still have a great war on our hands. New York's Times Square is out in party clothes again, but the multicolored lights blazing in all their glory to shine down on a crowd that deserves to celebrate before they roll up their sleeves and get back on the job. With the lifting of the brown out, it's again the Great White Way. The answer to that strange death. The grand old lady of them all has her day too, as the torch that has been a symbol of liberty and the statue itself is once more lighted to remind our enemies that freedom and democracy will never perish. Look, America, and work until Japan goes down in defeat. The purpose of I Am an American Day is to welcome our new citizens, boys and girls who have become 21 years of age and take their places in the ranks of citizenship of our country, and men and women devoted to our country who have renounced all allegiance to their place of birth and have become citizens of the United States. Our celebration in New York City, as usual, will take place in Central Park, Sunday, May the 20th, at 2.30 p.m. Thousands and thousands of our new citizens have been invited, and they will all be there. And I invite you and all the people of the city of New York to take part in this great celebration Central Park, May 20th, a Sunday, at 2.30 p.m. We will have a splendid program for you. I'll see you in Central Park. The Red Schoolhouse at Reims, France as peace is signed with German General Jodl acting for the remnants of the Nazi government. Jodl, for a few hours, was the chief of staff of the German army, while de Fuhrer's successor, Admiral Dönitz, was strangely missing. This is the news that electrified the world, unconditional surrender. In the temporary headquarters of General Eisenhower, our cameras record the scene as terms are laid down with the Supreme Commander represented by General Walter B. Smith. With the Americans, all the Allies sat in to enforce the terms we set long ago. Surrender with no soft terms. It seems hard for the Nazi yodel, and it was, to admit his country's guilt and plead for mercy. But General Smith's signature is a symbol of a new world of peace. A Bill of Rights for Europe. Nothing could be more symbolic of the downfall of the Third Reich than this abject surrender. Let us not forget Germany, but meanwhile, let us fight to quick victory over Japan.
20th, the German group sent on their way for further ratification of their signatures. The Allied delegates visit General Eisenhower's private headquarters. It's a happy day for the victors. Victory with the pens of peace. En route to prison camps throughout the United States, 3,000 German prisoners of war arrive in New York. Dirty and bedraggled, they nevertheless present a different appearance from the undernourished, mistreated Americans who suffer the tortures of hell in Nazi prison camps. And if you think Prussian arrogance has been conquered, take a good look at this officer being searched. These are the last German captives that'll be brought to this country. They range in age from 13 to 60. They all assured army authorities that they were anti-Nazi and had never harmed a soul. A tale we will hear many times before the last war criminal is liquidated. Mussolini is dead in a howling mob in Milan where fascism was born, provides the sordid finale as it attempts to vent its rage on the body of sawdust Caesar and his followers executed a short time before by Italian partisans after a summary trial. <laughs> Signal Corps cameras record the blind fury of a people whom he led to disaster after promising them an empire through 20 strutting and corrupt years. Spirit of the mighty 7th War Loan, Iwo Jima and its historic Mount Suribachi flag look down on a Times Square crowd assembled for the opening of the Bond Drive. All eyes are focused on the three survivors of that immortal flag raising who are present to raise that same flag again over the statue commemorating their deed. They raise that flag on Iwo with their blood. Repay them with your Bond purchases. Mrs. Truman arrives in Washington to observe Mother's Day with her son, the President of the United States. Every American shares the happiness of the President and his inspiration, his mother. Five happy warriors debark at Fort McPherson, Georgia and check their points under the new Army Discharge System. 85 are required for eligibility, and boy, have they got them. Sergeant Stroud of Clayton, Georgia, is first, along with 132 others. And after more than five years of service, he's more than glad to give back his GI duds to Uncle Sam. He drew a $1,400 check and has 200 more of his mustering out pay coming. Good luck, soldier. You've earned your country's gratitude. The Congressional Medal of Honor, the country's highest award, is presented to Corporal Robert D. Maxwell. It was one of President Roosevelt's last acts to sign the citation for the corporal who distinguished himself in the Battle of France. And the first medal to be awarded by President Truman is given to the parents of Private Elmer E. Fryer, who was killed in action. This ceremony at Denver honors two of Colorado's outstanding heroes. To the parents of Private Fryer, nothing can replace their son, but he lives forever in his country's heart. It's a great day for turf fans as the horse parks get set for another big season after a wartime blackout. The thoroughbreds go through their paces at the nation's tracks. All except this spirited fellow who appears to resent going back to work. But the fans are eager for all the thrills of a photo finish and 30,000 turn out at Narragansett, Rhode Island to watch the first opening and get down a bet after the long dry spell. And with everybody tensed for the getaway, the field is off to a rousing start. Night editor.
Predator won the first. And now, daily double addicts hold everything as the entries for the second race hit their stride on the back stretch. Cake gravy begins to forge ahead as one of the riders tumbles. The pace gets hotter coming into the finish, just the kind of a finish the crowd has been looking forward to. The riderless horse is running third as the record turnout watches Cake Gravy hit the tape a winner. The noble sport of kings is back in its stride once more. Spawning grounds of U-boat warfare. From these wrecked submarine pens came the underwater prowlers that sank millions of tons of Allied shipping. Prefabricated submarines at this Bremen shipyard might have put Germany on a mass production basis if the war had continued for a short time longer. But the scourge has ended. The U-858 approaches Cape May, New Jersey after having surrendered at sea to two destroyer escorts. The 240-foot underseas craft is manned by an American prize crew keeping a watchful eye on the Nazi skeleton crew which remained to operate the ship. The prisoners, who sank 18 Allied vessels, come ashore to await confinement at Fort Miles. Barely a day later, a second submarine arrives at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, after having surrendered formally off the main coast. The submarine's officers await transfer to shore. This U-boat is credited with a speed of 20 knots and a cruising range of 10,000 miles. The prisoners are taken to Portsmouth Naval Prison, where they will be kept for an indefinite period. The U-boat peril is dead, but this arrogant captain personifies an unrepentant Nazism. Berlin's army school is the end of the road for the Nazi reign of terror. Here, Air Marshal Tedder, General Eisenhower's deputy, and Russia's Marshal Zhukov meet with Field Marshal Keitel, a haughty Prussian aristocrat and representative of the general staff. This time, it's the German army that surrenders. No civilians are involved as in World War I. This time, the Wehrmacht takes its full share of blame for years of ruin and brutality. Keitel signs, marking the end of all German military action. Tedder and Zhukov add their signatures to the document that surrenders Germany to Allied control and completes Nazi humiliation. Following the ratification, the Allied officers tour the gutted Nazi capital. Berlin's once proud architecture is only a memory. Years of heavy pounding by the RAF and American air forces have made Germany's first city almost unlivable. Thousands of tons of bombs have pockmarked the famous Brandenburg Gate and laid waste the Hotel Adlon, former meeting place of world travelers. All Nazi government buildings have been destroyed burying the infamous Hitler and Goebbels in their rubble. Berlin's history, as one of the world's great capitals, is ended. Not only her capital, but most of Germany's mighty industrial cities are wiped out. These first pictures of Hamburg, made by the RAF, reveal the indescribable destruction wrought by repeated air attacks on the Reich's second city. Once the largest seaport on the continent of Europe, Hamburg's docks along the River Elba served the shipping of the world. Now, Hamburg is a ghost city, only the outer walls of its thousands of buildings standing in mute testimony to the overwhelming power of a light bombing. Bombing that tore the heart out of the Reich and buried tyranny in its ashes. At Merkers, Germany, this salt mine holds one of the strangest secrets of the war. A secret that was to deal Germany a crushing financial blow during the last days of the conflict. Here, GIs uncovered a fabulous hoard of jewelry, silver, currency, bullion, and art treasures. Much of it, the accumulated loot of five years of war. Practically every museum in Europe is represented in these masterpieces, which include Raphael's, Rembrandt's, Van Dyck's, and many other great masters' works, buried now 1,200 feet below the ground, 
in what the Nazis considered a safe hiding place and a bomb-proof shelter. The 100 tons of gold bullion represents most of Germany's reserve. Signal Corps pictures show the enormous cache of currency from all the European countries in Reichsbank containers. Two million dollars in American money also were found. Allied officials will take charge of the treasure until its disposition has been decided. Murder will out, even from the depths of the earth. High in the Alps, just a few miles from the Brenner Pass, a picturesque villa is the meeting place of Allied authorities and German political and war prisoners. Among them are the wife and daughter of former Chancellor Schusnig of Austria. He was married during captivity, and one of Hitler's former financial backers, industrialist Fritz Tyson, with his wife. Many royal prisoners were brought here from the Dachau prison camp, as was General Halder, formerly of the German general staff, and Pastor Niemöller, the anti-Nazi Hitler dared not kill. Also among the liberated was a group of allied flyers and the nephew of the King of England, Lord Lascelles, captured in Italy. Another of the freed was Lieutenant John Wynant, son of our ambassador to England. Farther north at Magdeburg, we meet a German of a different stripe, General Dietmars, Nazi military radio commentator and previous military governor of Magdeburg surrenders to the Yanks. Dietmar's voice had failed long ago, and he used a double, like many another fallen Nazi blowhard. Our superfort raids on Japan are swiftly being intensified as more and more of the B-29s roll from the assembly lines. This strike at Nagasaki blasts at airplane factories. From Saipan, others blast at Tokyo, and Iwo Jima-based fighters escort the heavy planes with an Army Air Force camera along. Flak is heavy, but Jap pilots were caught by surprise to find a fighter escort, and scores of enemy planes were picked off by the Mustangs from Iwo Jima. Heavy fires are burning as we start for home, dodging a blanket of flak. Those of the forts badly hit head for the strip at Iwo Jima instead of their home on Saipan. Thus, by using this new base, 50 landed safely that otherwise might have been lost. Pierced by numerous shell holes, their sturdy construction and skillful piloting brought them back safely. Japan will meet the fate of ruined Germany as we throw more and more power against her. Sixty-five battle bombers come into Bradley Field, Connecticut from Europe with more than a thousand veterans of the Continental Air War. Home at last with 30-day furloughs. It's a dream sealed with a kiss. After their furloughs, the men will be trained in new heavy bombers, and then on to Japan. But now the only thoughts here are to sort their clothing and gear and head for home as soon as possible. These are the types of American youth who broke the back of the Luftwaffe. Mascots will have a rest too before they go on to war in the East. President Truman has appointed Judge Lewis Swellenbach of Spokane, Washington as Secretary of Labor, the first of three new cabinet nominations. Thomas C. Clark of Dallas, Texas will succeed Francis Biddle as Attorney General in a shift which brings three Westerners to the President's official family. Mr. Clark has been Assistant Attorney General under Mr. Biddle. Representative Clinton Anderson of New Mexico becomes the nation's new Secretary of Agriculture, succeeding Claude Wickard. Secretary of State Edward R. Statinius calls for full liberty for people throughout the world. The four freedoms stated by President Roosevelt, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear are from the point of view of the United States 
the fundamental freedoms which encompass all other rights and freedoms. The United States government will work actively and tirelessly, both for its own people and through the international organization for peoples generally toward the protection and the promotion of these rights and freedoms. Charles Ross, an old friend of President Truman, becomes White House Press Secretary. Mrs. Ross congratulates him. Steve Early looks over the commission with his successor. Mr. Ross undertakes one of the Capitol's most difficult jobs. One of the President's forward-looking acts is to seek the advice of former President Hoover in the administration of food relief to Europe. Arriving at the White House, Mr. Hoover is greeted by the President, who will benefit by Mr. Hoover's vast experience in food administration during World War I. A wise counselor in time of need. Prominent in the public eye is General Courtney Hodges, who arrives in his native Georgia after leading his victorious First Army through Germany. He receives an ovation from the citizens of Atlanta. One of the largest crowds in the city's history is on hand to honor Georgia's foremost soldier, the great leader of one of America's greatest fighting teams. Sensation of this year's baseball season is one-armed Pete Gray of the St. Louis Browns. Despite his handicap, Pete asks and gives no favors, standing right up there with the best of them. He played two years for Memphis and came to the big leagues on his own merits. His arm was lost when he was six, but that didn't kill his spirit nor his dreams of making the big leagues. His batting average is good, though most of his hits are singles. Even when he grounds out, he gets the plaudits of the crowd. In left field, he really shines, and base runners are wary of the speed with which he discards his glove and throws to bases. His pluck and determination is an inspiration to all. Heroic dead of a combined Army and Marine force mark the grim battlefield of Okinawa, where one of the bloodiest engagements of the war is being fought. Thousands of Yanks have been wounded and other thousands have sacrificed their lives to drive a fanatical foe from this vital base, the doorstep to Japan itself. A canine hero suffers a wound, spotting ambushed Japs, but collects a souvenir. The 62-mile island contains many airfields and naval bases valuable to our Pacific strategy. Admiral Nimitz congratulates our troops and watches the battle's progress. Along the Jap southern defense line between Naha, Shuri, and Yonabaru, the Yanks advance slowly, facing one of the fiercest artillery barrages of the war. In a few hours, the enemy poured 10,000 shells into a front of only 9,000 yards. Each small advance is gained by sheer grit in the face of withering fire from a suicidal enemy being slowly hammered back into the hill. Powerful tank flamethrowers blast enemy caves on strategic Sawtooth Ridge near Naha. Newsreel, Signal Corps, and Marine cameramen risk their lives to film the furious action near Sugarloaf, Conical, and Chocolate Drop Hills, and other cave and trench Jap positions. The enemy defense line across the island is forced back and flanked at both ends by the dogged attack. Cautiously advancing on the firmly dug in enemy, Yanks plant a heavy charge of dynamite. Tens of thousands of dead Japs litter the battlefield. In the southern part of the island, less than 25,000 of the original garrison of 80,000 Japs are cornered. Dummy tanks are left behind by the enemy, retreating into the defenses of Naha, 
under attack by our big guns. The going is brutal and our casualties are high, but Okinawa stands squarely across the road to Tokyo and the China coast. It's the next big step toward victory over Japan, a victory that can only be won by work, war bonds, and heroic sacrifice. The nation remembers her dead of this and other wars. At the tomb of the unknown soldier, Colonel Lowry, representing the president, places Mr. Truman's tribute to an honored hero of World War I. Solemn homage from the people, pausing reverently in the midst of war. At a national cemetery in Brooklyn, as at others throughout the country, pilgrimages to the flower-bedecked graves prove anew that a grateful nation will never forget those who died, that America might live. <music> Troops are among the 25,000 who parade up New York's Riverside Drive. The banner that has been carried through the years by our heroes flies proudly. <music> For the first time, no Civil War veteran is able to appear in this annual tribute. A hundred thousand take part in the impressive martial salute, reviewed by Mayor LaGuardia and other dignitaries. The spirit of America's fighting men marches on. At Anzio, Italy, scene of one of our bloodiest landings, a group of rangers pays a visit to the fields where they fought. Captured by the Germans and freed by the Russians in Poland, they're on their way home. First, they visit the cemetery where many of their buddies lay buried for a last silent farewell. Signal Corps cameras show that they have remembered. Memorial Day will be every day for them, for you can't forget the man who died at your side. Let us remember the best Memorial Day tribute we can pay. Work harder for final victory. Ripped from stem to stern by the attacks of Jap suicide pilots off Okinawa, the destroyer USS Laffey comes home. Skippered by Commander Beckton, the fire-blackened ship is on display at Seattle, visual evidence of the desperate need for more shipyard workers. The Laffey was struck with everything in the Jap book. In the savage attempt to finish her off, 22 suicide pilots roared over her. Seven bomb-loaded planes crashed on her decks. The final score was... Nine enemy planes shot down by the Laffey, but 32 of her brave men were dead or missing, and 60 were wounded. A Jap suicide boat, souvenir of the battle. 15,000 more workers are needed to repair ships damaged in the Pacific. Stay on the job until final victory. Mrs. Truman makes her first public appearance since becoming the First Lady at Washington Airport, where she is to christen two service transport planes as a part of the war loan drive. The planes were bought with Congressional Club bond sales. The First Lady gives the bottle a lusty swing, and with a little help, the plane is duly christened. The big ships are fitted for the evacuation of wounded. More bonds mean more planes. A byproduct of the war, air rescue is being developed into a fine art by members of the RCAF in Jasper National Park. Special helmets and masks are used by these volunteers who undergo 14 weeks of strenuous training for forest rescue work. Hand-picked pilots fly the dangerous terrain. Each candidate must make at least four timber jumps over densely wooded country and deliberately maneuver his chute so that he lands in trees. This boy knows the ropes. It's a bullseye. He then lowers himself from the tree with a rope attached to the chute's risers. He has hit a designated target from a height of 2,000 feet. 
A thorough course in first aid lasting six weeks is part of the training. And getting the wounded back to civilization is an intricate and sometimes dangerous business. The last lap to safety. War's techniques help open the wilderness. The silver lining in a dark cloud. Visiting the White House at President Truman's invitation, the regent and heir apparent to the throne of Iraq, Prince Abdul Ilah, will be in the United States for an extended stay. The press greets the 33-year-old royal visitor, a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. While here, the prince will inspect U.S. power and irrigation projects with an eye to his own country's needs, now that the clouds of war have cleared in Europe. General Mark Clark, commander of America's Fighting Fifth Army, arrives in Chicago, home of his boyhood, to receive a hearty welcome from the crowd at the airport. With Mayor Kelly, the hero of the bitter Italian campaign proceeds down Michigan Boulevard. General Clark's command pinned down and finally captured 25 German divisions after two years of fighting. Mrs. Clark bestows the warrior's reward. War Food Administrator Jones appeals for more farm labor. The need this year for town and city people to pitch in and help the farmer harvest and grow his crops is greater than ever before. Victory on one front does not mean there will be any less demand for food. In fact, the need will be even greater. I make this appeal to everyone in this audience. When the call comes in your community, answer it if you can. Men and women, boys and girls, all who can give a part-time of their vacation or all through the harvest should do so and should volunteer now before your county agricultural agent or your local farm employment office. The need is urgent. Your help on a farm will help make our victory complete. Point of interest in conquered Germany for the victorious allies is the prison at Landsberg, where Adolf Hitler was once confined. The former paper hanger was jailed in 1923 in this cell for attempting to overthrow the government. Here he wrote Mein Kampf, planting the seed of Nazi persecution and terror. He returned in 1934 to the cell and signed the visitor's book. The convict was proud of his early days. Hitler's lofty mountain retreat at Berchtesgaden was wrecked by Allied bombs before our ground troops moved in. These are Signal Corps and Air Force pictures. Officers set German laborers to work cleaning up the wreckage. The Great Hall, where he held many war conferences, is a shambles. Hitler's citadel stands as a symbol of defeat. Prize thief among the high Nazis was Hermann Goering, who looted museums and private collections in all parts of Europe. Much was hidden in caves, and advancing troops captured fully laden freight cars, ready to move much of the collection to safer places for Hermann. Goering's ill-gotten loot is no longer his to admire. The collection goes on display for GIs before an Allied commission attempts to return everything to the proper owners. The castle of Neuschwanstein, overlooking Fusen, housed a great part of the art treasures stolen by the Nazis. Taken from royal families, the Rothschilds, and private French collectors, many of the 23,000 pieces were never unpacked. Not content with robbing people of their freedom and their lives, the Nazis tried to make off with their symbols of culture. Among the criminals rounded up is Field Marshal von Rundstedt, 
His arrogance subdued, but not much, as he's taken into custody. The typically Prussian professional soldier is captured along with his son. It was von Rundstedt who was picked by Hitler to stem the Allied tide in France. Another prize is Field Marshal Kesselring, who was smashed with his armies in Italy. He doesn't seem downcast, yet. He'll stand trial, and that goes for Goering, too. The number two Nazi has the blood of thousands on his hands, and for that, he will have to answer. He wears few of his prized medals, as he's taken to headquarters for preliminary questioning by 7th Army officers and to surrender his arms. Members of the American and British press are present to interview the former head of the Luftwaffe. And, you guessed it, he blames everything on his old pal, Hitler. If Hermann looks worried, maybe he's remembering that he originated concentration camps and was in charge of Hitler's bloody purges, to mention but two of his crimes. He said, the Allies understand me. We do, Herr Goering. For the butcher you are, you're a criminal at bay. One of the miracles of Allied supply, the English Channel Pipeline, can now be revealed. Long lengths of flexible steel pipe carried part of the million gallons of gas delivered daily from the Isle of Wight to the French coast. The original idea was conceived by British engineers who also utilized lead piping somewhat similar to a submarine telegraph cable. Three inches in diameter, the pipe was thoroughly insulated from sea action. Captured Nazi officers credited the undersea pipeline with being one of the main factors contributing to the downfall of the Wehrmacht. <laughs> Following a test operation, cable ships began paying out the pipe soon after D-Day. Both lead and steel tubing, much of it made in America, were used to carry the vital fuel to our fighting fronts. The pipe, wound on huge drums 30 feet in diameter, was released while being towed across the channel. The Luftwaffe was missing on this occasion also, and the first line crossed in 10 hours. Near the tip of the Normandy Peninsula, the pipeline comes ashore. Altogether, 20 lines were soon providing a constant fuel supply. Carefully camouflaged buildings in the southeastern part of England hid pumping stations from enemy eyes. Delivered close to the actual fighting front, the fuel kept our planes, trucks and tanks operating on the drive on Hitler's Reich. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. With the same completeness as was the power of the European dictators. To do that, we are now engaged in a process of deploying millions of our armed forces against Japan in a mass movement of troops and supplies and weapons over 14,000 miles. A military and naval feat unequaled in all history. Substantial portions of Japan's key industrial centers have been leveled to the ground in a series of record incendiary raids. 
What has already happened to Tokyo will happen to every Japanese city whose industries feed the Japanese war machine. If the Japanese insist on continuing resistance beyond the point of reason, their country will suffer the same destruction as Germany. Our blows will destroy their whole modern industrial plant and organization, which they have built up during the past century and which they are now devoting to a hopeless cause. We have no desire or intention to destroy or enslave the Japanese people, but only surrender can prevent the kind of ruin which they have seen come to Germany as a result of continued useless resistance.